please? What am I calling the police for? Because I don't want to go with mommy. Why you don't want to go with mommy? Oh my god. You're telling me to call the police? So you saying call the police? Yeah. What is wrong at mommy's house that you don't want to go to mommy's house? Oh. Tell me, it's okay. Come, <laughs> come, grandma got to do your hair. <laughs> Why are you crying? You don't want to see mommy? Yeah. Why? I want to see mommy. Huh? I want to see mommy. You what? You want to see mommy? Why you don't want to see mommy? I don't want to see mommy. Don't cry. You got to go see mommy. You don't want mommy? No. Why are you crying like that? We just going to visit, okay? Don't cry. Why are you crying, pumpkin? You have to see mommy. Okay? Don't cry. No. the tragic death of a seven-year-old girl in the Bronx. Now the child's grandmother is speaking out and demanding answers. ACS and SEO services has failed me. I was trying. <laughs> I was trying to keep this from happening. Through the noise of a busy Bronx bodega, one customer stood out as she walked to the deli counter to place her order a cheeseburger and a bagel with cream cheese and jelly. She was just a little girl and she was all alone. Ernie Slade, the store's janitor, could not forget her. She was wearing a pink mask and appeared to have a bruise under one eye. He said she was standing with a food stamp card in hand, waiting for her food. As he thought about it, he realized that to get to the store, she had probably crossed a busy four-lane intersection of East 138th Street by herself and he contemplated walking her to a nearby police precinct. He ultimately decided to not get involved, something he later regretted. Just days later, on August 10th, 2021, minutes before 8 a.m., Navasia Jones knocked on the door of a neighbor while yelling for help and exclaiming that her daughter had stopped breathing. The neighbor, Janine Raveno, ran into Jones' apartment and saw Julicia laying down halfway in her room with her older brother holding her up. At 8.06 a.m., 911 operators received a call leading them to dispatch emergency personnel to a Mitchell House apartment in the 100 block of Alexander Avenue. Navasia handed the phone to Raveno, who after instruction told dispatchers that when she placed her hand on the child's stomach, it did not move. When first responders arrived, Julicia had no pulse or vital signs and was immediately transported to Lincoln Hospital where she was pronounced dead within an hour. Doctors told police she had apparent trauma to her face and the right side of her body, had an internal temperature of 96.6 Fahrenheit, and was cold to touch. When interviewed about the child's injuries, the child's mother, Navasia, and her 17-year-old son, Paul Fine Jr., told investigators that Julicia had fallen downstairs the previous day. The mother-son duo allegedly said that the child then vomited and urinated on herself at approximately 5 a.m. and fell against various items including hitting her head on a desk in the apartment or on the floor. Furthermore, they had failed to call 911 for at least three.
three hours. Julicia's murder was one of a string of deaths that prompted the city to make changes in the child welfare system. She had a case filed with the city's child welfare agency from the day she was born due to concerns that her older siblings had been abused. Julicia's grandmother, Yolanda Davis, said she fought for custody of the child but was forced to return her to her mother's care in 2020. Davis had made it clear since the child's passing that the system failed her granddaughter who she described as a beautiful child who did not deserve what she had gotten. After being born on April 26, 2014, Julicia was immediately removed from the custody of her parents by the Child Welfare Agency. The agency had decided that her safety was being endangered by her parents' failure to provide a minimum degree of care. Subsequently, a judge ordered that the child's father be referred to domestic violence counseling. This was far from the first sign of difficulties for the family as Navasia had already lost custody of her five other children after they were found with signs of physical abuse. At between five and seven days old, Julicia was placed in the care of her paternal grandmother Yolanda Davis who picked her up from the hospital. When Jones was allowed a first visit, she held her infant daughter and refused to give her back, prompting Davis to call the police. This resulted in Jones not being allowed to return. Julicia's parents sought inroads into her life. Julius, her father, was allowed to visit her on weekends at certain points on the condition that Jones, her mother, not be present. Navasia walked to reclaim her rights to see and gain custody of Julicia and her other children, court records indicated. She completed required parenting classes and other classes including anger management. For Julicia, her mother's appearances in her life and her parents' hostile relationship were extremely disruptive, reaching a peak in 2017. Yet. She was briefly placed with her mother in 2017 before that decision was reversed with records stating that she should not have been removed from her grandmother's custody. That year, when she was three years old, she was removed from her grandmother's custody by Child Welfare Agency and placed in foster care because of the continuation of domestic violence issues between her parents. The agency said, that her father had violated his visitation rights by coming to see her without supervision at Davis's home and that he had threatened to harm Jones and unnamed children during a dispute with her. At the age of four years old, the date was April 13, 2018. And what my granddaughter said was, Mom, hit me with a hammer. Everybody was walking around, black eyes and all of that. Next day they see her with shades on at a party. I can't even sleep. She was my best friend. <laughs> but he hadn't seen the little girl since she was two because he said Julicia's mother was constantly making domestic violence complaints against him and his mother, Yolanda Davis. Um, the book is... Um consist of all the ACS cases. From the time Julicia was born, her parents were battling it out for custody. Julius Batiste's mother, the paternal grandmother, said she got custody of baby Julicia on May 1st, 2014. She'd been here since she was five days old. But the extensive court records show there was always a battle over the little girl who loved to sing and never gave a problem, according to her grandmother, and posed in a school photo before the pandemic with her favorite characters from the movie Frozen. But because of the domestic violence complaints, which Julius Petit says are false, he was not allowed to stay in the same household with the child. They made me choose between my, my son and my granddaughter. I had to pick the baby. Julius's grandmother told us at first, the biological mother used to visit her little girl here in Brooklyn at the grandmother's apartment, but then the fighting escalated over primary custody. At one point, Julicia was given to her biological mother in 2017, but a follow-up report said removing Julicia from the home of Yolanda Davis was not correct, and the child went back to her paternal grandmother the same year.
Then the pandemic hit in March 2020, and the grandmother was notified Julicia would be staying with her biological mother. She said that the reason why she is on extended visit was because of the pandemic. Now, a year and a half later, a memorial is growing in the lobby of Mitchell Houses in the Bronx. Neighbors said that they had made reports. Michael Roberts noted that he'd hear Navasia yelling at the children all the time, and he had called the police and child welfare officials about the family. His girlfriend, Jasmine Jones, had also told him that on August 6th, she had seen the girl with a swollen black eye. When Jasmine asked Julissa who hit her, she allegedly said it was her mother, which prompted the woman to call the welfare agency and make a report. Two days later, Michael saw the mother and daughter in the elevator and the girl was wearing sunglasses. Another neighbor, Mina Cruz, said she called the child welfare agency on July 8th and July 12th to report seeing Julicia waiting for an elevator alone in addition to walking the street and running errands by herself. Child's death, but one neighbor who did not want to be identified says she made calls to child services multiple times. I was here screaming. They came, they spoke to them. I seen her with a black eye on like Thursday or something like that. So that's why I called ACS because she told me her mother did that to her. As the investigation into Julicia's death continued, authorities learned more about her final days. In an interview with personnel from the city's administration for children's services, ACS, her half-brother Paul allegedly confessed, saying that he had assaulted the child all over her body between August 8th and August 10th, and admitted to punching Julicia multiple times on the day of her death, according to the DA's office. Via an autopsy, the chief medical examiner determined the child died by blunt force trauma to her abdomen from being struck with a blunt object and was hit so hard her internal organs were torn and she bled internally. Investigators concluded that Julicia suffered greatly in the hours before her death at the hands of her mother and teenage half-brother. Examiners found multiple bruises visible about the child's entire face, chin, back of right ear, both of her wrists, her clavicle, upper thigh, and mouth. The medical examiner also found that Julicia had sustained pattern bruising on her face, which was likely caused by an adult's fist and ruled her manner of death as homicide. Investigators said the initial claims made by Jones were inconsistent with the fatal and non-fatal injuries on Julicia's body. Postmortem results also showed that the seven-year-old girl had been sodomized. Sources say that Navasia Jones covered for her son Paul on at least one of the six occasions in the past three years when police were called to their home. In the weeks after her death, each of her parents made arrangements with separate funeral homes in regard to their daughter's final resting place. Because of that, the city's office of the chief medical examiner said that it could not release Julicia's body until the parents either came to an agreement or the court decided. A month following her passing, Naveja filed a petition asking a judge to grant her control over funeral arrangements and the disposition of the girl's body. She wanted to have her daughter cremated, stating that the reason was because she wanted to have something to remember Julicia by. The child's father and paternal grandmother disagreed and wanted the seven-year-old to be laid to rest, and he had already picked out a casket in one of her favorite colors, pink, and arranged for a horse-drawn carriage at the funeral to make sure she, quote, goes out like a princess. The continuing battle caused Julicia's funeral arrangements to be delayed. Ultimately, Navasia lost the case and was permitted to attend the wake for one hour as a part of an agreement she struck with Julius. The father, along with his mother, identified Julicia via photos and told media sources that he cried throughout. Mourners packed John's funeral home in Brooklyn on November 1st, 2021 for the wake and funeral in honor of Julicia. 
The seven-year-old was buried in the pink casket, wearing a white dress she picked out for a wedding, which she attended, as was the suggestion of her grandmother. Almost a year later, on June 29, 2022, the NYPD arrested 36-year-old Navasia Jones and now 18-year-old Paul Fine Jr. for allegedly causing Julicia's death. The mother-son duo was indicted by a grand jury on charges of two counts of second-degree murder under circumstances evincing a depraved indifference to human life, two counts of second-degree manslaughter, and three counts of endangering the welfare of a child. Paul also faced charges of first-degree sexual abuse, which investigators believed occurred after she had already been injured and was dying, in addition to first-degree assault. As she was led out of the 40th Precinct Station House, Naveja cursed at reporters. She was followed by Fine Jr. The defendants were arraigned before Bronx Supreme Court Justice Marsha Michael and both were remanded. Julicia Batty's father, Julius Batty, witnessed the perp walk, though he told media sources that justice had not yet been fulfilled. He said they dissolved what they got and vowed to ensure that justice is obtained for his daughter. The father had been vocal in saying that ACS had failed his daughter by not offering the protection she dissolved. He went on to say that he will see a modicum of justice now that the individuals allegedly responsible have been apprehended. The father also said that now her mother and brother had been arrested he could finally begin healing. I'm never going to get a chance to see my daughter again. And that's something I got to live with for the rest of my life. And I don't know how to deal with it. Wiping away tears, Julius Batis shares his grief. I couldn't believe my daughter endured all that pain and suffering and nobody did nothing for my baby. Assaulted. This is a revolting, disturbing case of brutality and callousness. Julissa Batty's death was horrific and her seven years on earth were a lifetime of pain. Julicia's mother, 36-year-old Navazia Jones and her 18-year-old half-brother Paul Fine are both charged with her murder. They were escorted out of the 40th precinct today. The seven-year-old's grandmother says Julicia had lived with her since birth and was only returned to her mother five months before her death, something she never agreed with. My granddaughter was a beautiful child that did not deserve what she had gotten. And so for that, I asked God to give me justice for her. And he has done just that. The family says the arrests are a step in the right direction. Even though I gotta live with this, I still have my daughter. Julicia's paternal grandmother says she repeatedly tried to get custody of Julicia over the years. She says she told caseworkers that her granddaughter was being abused at the mother's apartment in the Mitchell houses. But they never listened to what I told them. I got my granddaughter to finally say something to them. My granddaughter said that she did not want to ever go back there. She's my everything still. I think about her every day. She always with me, so I, I use her as my strength to keep going. Following his arrest, Paul's attorney petitioned the court to have his case moved to family court because he was 17 at the time of the crime of which he was accused. Yolanda Davis, told reporters that she agreed with the district attorney that he should be tried as an adult following her exit of the courthouse after seeing graphic photos that included images of her granddaughter with a black eye. Davis continued to speak out against ACS over their handling of the case, saying photos showed that case workers had seen the child with a black eye days before she died and failed to remove her from her mother's custody. I will be following the outcome of this case, and I truly hope that Julicia's family and friends receive justice in her name. May the family and friends of Julicia Batiste find solace in the happy memories, and may her soul rest in perpetual peace. Thank you.